You know, I don't know when or how it is that buildings become symbols, but I just know that some of them do. I mean, we have uh, the Broma Seltzer Tower. We've got uh, the aquarium. We've got Camden Yards, and all of them are buildings. Uh, all of them are tourist attractions, to be certain. Um, they're part of our skyline for Charm City, but they aren't symbols of our city. Instead, you know, they are their landmarks. The reason we call them landmarks is because, well, they mark the land. When you see the Bromo Seltzer Tower, when you see Natty Bow, when you see Camden Yards, and if you're familiar with Baltimore, you know that you're in Baltimore. It marks the land for you. But then there are other buildings, well, they, they become symbols. They're still buildings, but they become symbols, like the White House. That's a symbol of the head of our federal government as well as a place where work takes place and where people live. The Capitol building, that's a symbol of our federal government. Now how and when they became symbols, I can't tell you. I just know that they are. I mean, that's why, and you probably have already figured this out, that's why whenever someone is angry with the United States, in another country, they attack our embassy. Because even though the embassy is where our ambassador is and where our State Department runs its business from, it represents to people the United States. So if they're angry with the United States, they attack the symbol of the United States. That's, that's supposedly what Osama bin Laden was doing all those years ago this month. 23 years ago, you know, when he attacked the trade towers, he, he said he was attacking capitalism, which he abhorred, though he benefited from it his whole life. I still hadn't worked that one out. You know, when he attacked the Pentagon, he was attacking the military industrial complex that has in fact oppressed many a person across the world. And had it not been for some very brave passengers that day, that fourth plane, well, it would have gone into the Capitol, which represents and symbolizes our democracy. You see, there are buildings that become symbols. And so one of the ways that you demonstrate that you have conquered a people, that you have vanquished a civilization, is to either take over or destroy their national symbols. See, that's what happened back in 70 A.D., Back in 70 A.D. or C.E., depending on which letters you want to use, there was this general named Titus, and he was head of the Roman army, and they laid siege to Jerusalem because Jerusalem had been in rebellion, uh, well, since about 66 A.D., so for about four years, and there had been a great deal of unrest, and uh, uh, the Roman Empire decided they were finally going to put an end to it all. And so sure enough, Titus came with the army and he laid siege and he busted through the first wall and he busted through the second wall of Jerusalem. But that third wall was the tough one because it was the thickest and they had uh, the rebels were placed in such a way that they could protect it the best. But sure enough, after a month's siege, they bust through the third wall and they come in and what do they do? they set fire to the temple of God there in Jerusalem. That's the very first thing they do is they absolutely level the temple. Why? Because it was the symbol of religious, cultural, and national identity for the people who we know as Jews, for the nation of Judah.
And then he went about the business of taking, I don't know, it depends on who you read, about 90,000 people captive. And the reason he was able to take 90,000 from a city of 60,000 was because it was during Passover where, I don't know, a few hundred thousand people come. So there were plenty of people in the city at the time. And so sure enough, he takes 90,000 captive. He kills probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 or 60,000. Uh, Josephus would like us to think it was a million, but Josephus had a way with numbers. Um, he should have been my accountant. Um, and so just devastates all of Jerusalem in AD 70. And so I want you to just imagine for a moment. I mean, some of you can remember back 23 years ago, right? You can remember how our hearts ached, right? How devastated we were. I remember I had a buddy who was working at the Pentagon at the time. He was a hundred yards down the hall from where the plane came into the building. It was a whole day before I found out that he was okay. I mean, you remember? So can you imagine that for your national city, for your capital city, for the whole thing just to be leveled. And on top of that, the place where God is supposed to live, the place where you go to pray, the place where you go to sacrifice, the place where you go to get right with God, the place that is the center of your life is just wiped away. You can imagine, right? You can just imagine how they feel like they are without any kind of mooring and they're just floating. And the question that are asking for years after is, what do we do now? This, this passage that uh, Miss Jeanette read for us, it's a, it's fascinating, it and the one that Julie read for us. I, I wondered if you noticed in the passage, in fact, let me, just, let me just read this to you from John again. Just the last half of it, John chapter 2, starting with verse 18. And these, just so you know, these events you're about to read about, they happen 40 years before the destruction, okay? So the whole place is destroyed in 70 AD. This takes place right here about 30 AD, okay? But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What? They exclaimed, it's taken 46 years to build this thing, to build this temple, sorry. And you can rebuild it in three days? But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. Now, the one thing I wonder if you noticed is, you noticed that in what Julie read in, in the book of Luke, in what Miss Jeanette read in the book of John, it seems like it's the same event, right? I mean, it, the same kind of things are identified as happening, this clearing of the temple. Did, did you notice, though, anything strikingly interesting about this? Well, let me put it this way. This event is so important that it is recorded in all four of the Gospels. Did you know that? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. All four. Now, there's only a few things that are recorded all four times in the gospel. I mean, Jesus' birth isn't recorded four times in the gospel. So you got to know that if it happens in all four of them, if it's recorded in all four of them, it's probably significant enough that we should pay attention to it, right? So check this out. This is what's interesting to me. 
You can find it in Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through 22. You can find it in Mark chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. You can find it in Luke chapter 19, verses 45 through 48. And you can find it in John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. So you caught that, right? It's Matthew 21, it's Mark 11, it's Luke 19, and it's John 2. Do you catch that? It's a little bit strange, isn't it? I mean, there are 28 chapters in Matthew, and this event shows up in chapter 21. Right? There are 16 chapters in Mark, but this event, it shows up in Mark chapter 11. There are 26, 26 in Luke? Yeah, 26 chapters in Luke, I'm going with that. And this shows up in chapter 19. But with John, there are 21 chapters, and this shows up in 2. Now you see, some folks would look at that and what they would tell you, and some pretty smart folks at that, they would tell you, well, the reason it shows up like that is because it's, um, it, it happened twice. The reason it happens at the beginning of John and at the end of the other three books is because it's happened twice. It's the two different events. But then there are others who would suggest to us that actually it's just one event. There's only one time when Jesus clears the temple. It's just that John chooses to put it in a different place. Now, I tend to be in that second group. I'm inclined to believe that Jesus only cleared the temple one time. And that doesn't make John wrong. You just have to understand that this author, John, he's not writing us a chronological biography. See, the others tend to be a little more chronological in what they do. But what John does is kind of interesting is he has this tendency to sometimes group events and teachings together to make a point. So, John knows that this thing really happened. He's not saying that it happened at the beginning of the ministry. He's just putting the story in chapter 2 because it's really important. He, do you remember... Uh, you remember when... Uh, We talked about a few weeks ago about what the purpose of the Gospel of John was. Did any of you, were, was, was there any, yeah, you guys were with me, right? Do you remember? It, we found it, it was the purpose was found in the back of the book, remember? And, and it said the purpose was so that we could continue to believe that Jesus was the Christ and that by believing in his name, the power of his name, we would have life, right? So the whole purpose of the book of John was to help us believe. So if you remember that the purpose of John is to help us believe, then it seems to me that there's something that John is doing here that's pretty essential to somebody's belief. Now you remember how we said that the people, the Jews, after AD 70 have just been devastated by losing what they understand to be the place where God lives? Well, here's something that's interesting. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all put it toward the end of the book, which is probably about where it happened. Well, three quarters of the way through, yeah? All three of them, in my humble opinion, were written before 70 AD. They were written before the temple was destroyed. But John, John was probably written somewhere between 75 and 85 AD. About five to 15 years after the temple was destroyed. 
And if you were writing after the temple was destroyed, if you were writing while you were in the midst of people who felt like they had lost the anchor of their faith, that their moorings had just been cut away, that they were adrift and they didn't even have any real direction because the temple used to be true north because that's where you would find God and now they don't know where to find God. Wouldn't it make sense that you would move it to the front so that you could at least from the very beginning of your book begin to give hope to people who have totally lost hope and maybe even to followers of Jesus who are still Jews who have been devastated by all of this and so what you do is you move the event to the front of the book so that right after you say in chapter 1 that Jesus is the word and that God has become flesh and dwells among us has moved into the neighborhood the second thing you say is and he's the one who knew that this temple was going to be destroyed and he's talking about himself when he talks about this temple because this crazy concept that John is about to develop for us and he goes on to really nail in John chapter 3 when he tells everybody that you got to be born again is that the God of the universe isn't going to be living in buildings anymore. He's going to live in us. And since I believe that the Holy Spirit of God inspired John to do that very thing, I got to tell you that shows a tremendous amount of compassion, if you ask me, from God to us. Because at that point where we struggle is the point where God meets us. And this isn't simply unique to this part of chapter 2 because for some of you who remember from a couple of weeks ago, remember the wedding? The kids were going to be embarrassed because they ran out of wine and Jesus wouldn't sit on the sideline and let them just deal with it. He wouldn't let their marriage start that way. Instead, he provides a lot of wine. It's done. And that's his first miracle. It's an act of compassion. And I want to suggest to you that this, too, is an act of compassion. First of all, by throwing a lifeline to all of those who, after 70 AD, have been devastated. Because the center of their life, as they understand it, has been crushed. But secondly... And this, this is interesting to me. If you want to see where God's compassion is, check this out. The first, uh, the first verses of this, starting with verse 13. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. So Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers, dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes, and he chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and the cattle and he scattered the money changers' coins over the floor and turned over their tables. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scripture, passion for God's house will consume me. There's a lot to consider here, and I'm not good enough to cover it all, but let me just make a couple observations, okay? In one of the other, transla or in, in one of the other accounts, it says that not only does he send them uh, hiking, but that he says... Uh, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers or a den of iniquity or something along those lines. Well, it seems to me that Jesus kind of clues us in with that statement as to what's going on here. Because you see, what's going on, actually, the, the selling of the animals and the exchanging money, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. 
There's nothing inherently wrong. Imagine this. Julie, you're coming with your donkey and your husband. I'm not calling him a donkey. <laughs> you're coming with your donkey and your husband and you're traveling 350 miles, okay? 350 miles, that's at least a week to 10 days you're traveling. Now you're coming to the temple because you want to worship. You're coming at one of the feast times and you've got to bring with you, and let's say you're fairly wealthy, you can bring a really nice sheep with you. Now, the odds of being able to bring that sheep from 10 to 12 days away and keep it healthy and keep it so that it has no marks or any blemishes or anything on it by the time it gets here and it's still fat and plump and, re and reflective of it being your first, the firstborn, you know, the, the best of your flock. Well, the likelihood of that happening is slim to none. So instead what you do is you travel to Jerusalem and you buy a really nice sheep and then you take it in and you offer it as a sacrifice to your God. You're not embarrassed about the sacrifice that you've offered. And maybe it's not a sheep, maybe it's a cow. And maybe you can't afford sheep or a cow. Well, then that's, you get a couple of doves. And so instead of having to bring those things from hundreds of miles away, you just get them there where you're going to worship. Totally makes sense, right? And the temple has its own currency. Yeah, they, they made their own coin. So what that meant was to get their coin, you had to bring your money from wherever you were coming from, and you had to exchange it. And so you had to exchange your money. And of course, money changers will always, anybody who's traveled anywhere knows that it, they, they get you when you exchange your currency. <laughs> Coming and going, right? And so sure enough, that's taking place too. It isn't in and of itself, it's not a terrible thing. But obviously because Jesus says, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Obviously, first of all, we can assume that the reason he drives them all out is because they're making some dosh off of what they're selling. So people who are wanting to worship might actually be prevented from worshiping because they live in poverty. And because even the doves that would be sold them or the pigeons or whatever, they can't afford because the price is too high because the people there are making more than a living. But the second reason that this marketplace thing is a problem for Jesus, I want to suggest to you, has to do with the layout of the temple. Why don't you try to picture this, okay? Imagine this pillar is a corner of, corner of uh, the temple in Jerusalem. And it goes to this wall. This is just one big wall, right? Well, the back of the temple building comes right to this wall, all right? And let's say it goes out like this. And so there are colonnades. There are places to walk on both sides going all the way up into the front entrance. And there's a colonnade there we call Solomon's Colonnade, right? Well, this right here where I'm standing, this would be the Holy of Holies. Now, the Holy of Holies, a uh, priest only really goes in once a year. There may be twice a year depending on the year. But but a priest only goes in there. So if I was really standing in the Holy of Holies, the true Holy of Holies right now, I'd be dead. Because that's what happens when you go in and you're not, you, you've not made yourself holy. You've not prepared yourself and been sanctified, right? Now, the reason it's called the Holy of Holies is because it used to be that the Ark of the Covenant was there and that God's presence in a special way rested on the mercy seat, which is where the wings of the two cherubim were like this at the top of the Ark of the Covenant, right? But the Ark of Covenant has long since been lost. It's gone. But they still 
recognize this is the Holy of Holies, and you come, and then there's like this curtain that's like about this thick, I mean crazy thick, and it goes all the way across, and it separates the Holy of Holies from the holy place. Now the holy place is the rest of the building really and it's got like a laver for you to wash your hands and it's got the the candelabra there and and uh, um, it's got some other things but I'm 60 and I can't remember. And so then you come out of the building of the holy place and there's the altar. The altar it's built up right there so you can walk right out and that's where sacrifices are offered, right? And then you come down the steps and there's a courtyard and this is called the court of the Jews and it's only where men, Jewish men can worship God. They're the only ones who are allowed in. So the priest and the men. And then when you go past that courtyard, between here and that colonnade I was telling you about, there's this large courtyard, and this was where the money changers were and where they were selling the, the, uh, the sheep and the cows and the doves and such. And this is called the Court of the Women, or the Court of the Women and the Aliens. Because if you feared the Lord, but you weren't Jewish, you could come here to pray. If you were a Jewish woman, you could come here to pray, but you could go no further. Now, Jesus, he says, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. One of the things I want to suggest to you, the reason he drives them out isn't because they aren't doing a service that's worthwhile, but because they're doing it in the only place that women and foreigners have to come and talk to God. And that is simply unacceptable to Jesus. And so he takes a rope and he makes a whip, and he drives them out of the temple. Now, nowhere in there, just so that we're clear, nowhere in there does it say he beats anybody with that whip. He uses that whip to drive out the animals. And the reason we know that is because when it comes to the, to the, to the doves, he doesn't hit the doves with the whip. He goes and said, get these things out of here. He drives the animals out. And as you drive animals out, the owners of the animals will go keep up with their animals, right? And so I want to tell you that this whole thing is about Jesus making it easier for people to worship God. And I want to suggest to you that not only does God have compassion on all people, especially the poor, especially the marginalized, especially the foreigner, but Jesus has set an example for you and me. And here is the one little bitty simple lesson that's my takeaway, okay? The only obstacle that should lie between a human being and the kingdom of God is the cross of Christ. <coughs> Our job is to make worship easier, not harder. And so that's why we should always be thinking about how we do what we do. Because one of the walls we've got to be tearing down is the one that keeps people from worshiping Jesus. Would you pray with me?
Lord Jesus, your, your compassion is never ending. It's just really mind blowing. And I thank you, Lord, that you would do something as brave as clearing the temple. We didn't even have time to talk about the kind of courage you had to have. And for you to take on a whole crowd and drive them out so that people could pray and people could worship and people wouldn't be taken advantage of. And so that the place where we gather for prayer would be called holy. Wow. You are so my hero. I am so in awe of your courage. Help us, Lord, as a community to have the courage to do whatever it takes to make it easier for people to worship you. Let us be faithful to hold forth the cross of Christ. But please don't let how we do church stand between them and you. I pray. Amen.